and welcome to CO 738 Probabilistic Methods. Today we'll be discussing Erdos Corrado. We note that today's lecture is a probabilistic lens, so it will be a bit shorter than the others. Today we'll be focusing on intersecting families. So a family F of sets is intersecting if A intersect B is non-empty for all A, B, and F. So quite a natural term, intersecting families. Here is a natural question about intersecting families, a well-studied object in combinatorics. It is, what is the maximum size of an intersecting family of k sets that are subsets of n? So if we had sets all of the same size, here k, and we know they're inside a larger set, so they're subsets of 1 up to n, what's the maximum size of an intersecting family, right? We can't just choose all of the sets as they may not all intersect. So what is this answer? Well, here's the first point, is that if n is small, so if n is less than 2k, the answer is n choose k. It's all of the k sets. If n is smaller than 2k, then every 2k sets actually intersect. So we could take all of them. So the more that's kind of the trivial answer when n is small. The interesting question is what happens if n is large, so if n is at least 2k. What is the answer? So this is an old and classical theorem, and that it's due to Erdos, Co, and Rado, arguably from 1938 is when they first proved it. It was published in 1961. So what is the answer if n is at least 2k and f is a subset of, and that's the notation of the set n choose k, so that's the k sets of n, uh, 1 up to n, is an intersecting family, then f is actually at most n minus 1 choose k minus 1. So it is a bit smaller than n choose k. And now, where does this come from? Well, we're going to prove it, but we'll also like to note that this is indeed tight. So this is, so the maximum is exactly n minus 1 choose k minus 1, and that is achieved by the following family, namely, take all of the sets that contain a given element. So here, say 1. So if you take all of the sets uh, with 1 in them, then there are n minus 1 choose k minus 1 choices the other k minus 1 elements of A, and thus this is an intersecting family that all intersect in that given element here being 1. So that notes that it's tight. Now we're going to move on to the proof. So we won't do the original proof. Instead, we give a short proof due to Katona from 1972. And what is the proof idea? Well, we're going to take a random mapping. So that's an idea we've seen uh, in previous lectures. And we're also going to upper bound via probability, right? So we're not trying to construct something random. We're trying to show a, a given upper bound. So we're going to somehow use probabilistic analysis to provide the upper bound. To do that, we will need some version of randomness. And here, as you'll see, we'll take a, a somewhat random permutation or random mapping more precisely uh, to show this. So what is the key idea? What is the structure of intersecting families? How can we possibly achieve this bound? Well, here's a nice concept. Let sigma be a permutation of n, so that's somewhat of a random ordering, but here no randomness yet, so we fixed it. We say a set A of subset of n is consecutive under sigma if there exists i in n such that A is sigma i, sigma i plus 1, etc., sigma i plus a minus 1, addition modulo n. So here, if I have a permutation, we'll say that a set is consecutive under it if it appears in consecutive order, again, thinking of it as a, as a cyclic permutation. So allowed to wrap around, that's the addition modulo n. So what good is that concept, it's quite natural, is actually we can say something meaningful about intersecting families about their consecutive sets. So namely, we have the following lemma. If f subset of n choose k, so that's again the sets, n is an intersecting family, and sigma is a permutation of n, then at most k elements of f are consecutive under sigma. So if we only look at the consecutive sets, the claim is that most k of them are in this f. Let's go through this proof. So you may want to pause and try to prove this yourself before I continue. But here is the proof. So we may assume there exists a set A and F that is consecutive under sigma. Otherwise, there is nothing to show. Then there should be none of them. It should be fine. Now, without loss of generality, we can assume that sigma is the identity. The permutation doesn't really matter then. And that A is 1 up to K. We can just fix it to be the first elements. K 
Given this, now we can proceed with characterizing the rest of the sets. So namely all other sets in F uh, that are consecutive have to be of the form I minus K plus one up to I or I plus one up to I plus K where I is in K minus one. So they have to, to be kind of left or right sets for one of these I. Then since F is intersecting, we have at most one from, from each of the pairs as these pairs don't actually intersect. That then uh, concludes the proof. So we have the set itself, and then with these overlapping options, these k minus one pairs, you can only have one from each pair. So on to the proof of the, the rest of the, the theorem. We take a random permutation sigma of n, i.e. where each permutation is equally likely. And so now that can just be thought of as, as a random ordering, but I'd maybe rather have you think of it as a random mapping that we can kind of map. If you take this random permutation, we'll look at the consecutive sets under that permutation. So this in some way is, is mapping all of the sets and the Fs as well to randomly into the consecutive sets. And now we do probabilistic analysis on that kind of random mapping. In particular, let X be the elements in F that are consecutive under sigma, right? So some of the sets became consecutive under sigma, which of the ones in F became consecutive under sigma? And well, by our lemma, X is in most K for every sigma. So you can never have more than K consecutive sets. Hence the expectation of X over all of the sigmas is in most K. So that's quite useful. So we, we know there's, because of the structure from the structural lemma, that we can never have more than k. So we can't expect more than k. Yet, if we did it a different way, this calculation, what would be the expectation? Well, so let's do that. Expectation of x would be the sum of the a and f, that the probability that a is consecutive under sigma. So by linearity of expectation, it's enough to consider for each given uh, a and f. What is its probability to be consecutive under sigma? Well, we know that's actually equal to n over n choose k. So there are n consecutive sets under sigma. If you take this over all of the sigma, there will indeed be n of these, uh, there'll be a n over n choose k ratio fraction uh, of these permutations uh, that will indeed give you consecutive under sigma. So that's what we have to deal with. And then we can, since the sum is the same for each, we can actually just rewrite this as the number of f times n over n choose k. And now what are we left to conclude? If you put these two together, we know that F, just rewriting this inequality, that F is at most K divided by N times N choose K. Canceling out with the factorials, this gives N minus one choose K minus one, which is concludes the proof and is the answer. So again, the idea being that N minus one choose K minus one is a K over N fraction of all the possible sets N choose K and really, for a given ordering, you can only expect at most k of the n consecutive sets to be in f. So if we take a random ordering, it will indeed in ensure this, you get this bound on all of them, on all from all the orderings to give us the desired upper bound. So that concludes the proof. So that's the proof of Erdos Corrado, a very nice theorem that's tight, uh, that uses some very nice probability. So until next time, see you then.